Um, I'm excited to tell you about some research that was recently published, um, trying to understand sort of the functional consequences of small scale features on animal surfaces. And so just very broadly speaking, oops. Um, okay, so broadly speaking, you know, animal exteriors are decorated with a wide range of different surfaces and structures. And so just a few examples of things that people have looked at in the past. Um, this, so shark skin, actually, if you zoom in on the tail of the shark, uh, it is decorated with these small scale features called denticles that can actually affect the fluid flow around the shark tail. And so there's some beautiful PIV movies showing that these things can actually actively control fluid flow. Um, another example is looking at gecko feet. So if you zoom in on the small scale structures of gecko feet, you find that they have the setae, which are actually uh, responsible for van der Waals, creating van der Waals forces that allow them to adhere to vertical surfaces. And so this allows them to climb walls. Um, and a third example that um, was recently published is looking at sort of small scale features on bird feathers. So if you zoom in on the structures within feathers, um, what you find is that there are these tiny barbs that are uh, sticking out from the feathers that actually allow the feathers to link together and provide stability as the bird is flying, um, preventing you know, sort of separation and airflow between feathers. And so these are just a few examples of structures, these complicated structures and some of the functions that people have discovered for these features. Um, and so I'm interested in sort of how the environmental physics uh, drives the sort of behavioral and morphological adaptation of features on animal exteriors. And so in particular, uh, I'm interested in locomotion. And as a soft matter physicist, I'm interested in movement in soft flowable environments um, that are present in natural habitats of animals. And uh, so I'm going to focus on locomotion because it's an essential behavior for survival. And I'm going to focus on limbless animals because their body is the only substrate, the only interaction bet between the animal and the substrate. So their body provides the only interface um, with the substrates that they're moving on. And so this is one example. This is sidewinding rattlesnake. And this is one example of uh, an effective movement in sand. And so just to convince you that moving in sand is not easy for all snakes, these are three species that do not encounter sand in their natural habitats. And so you can see that they're all struggling to make progress uh, in this, what is for them a challenging environment. And so um, really became interested in what's special about sidewinders and other snakes that are able to move effectively in these flowable environments. And so, we took a broad sampling of vipers from a variety of different environments. Um, so these are just pictures of all the individuals that we studied. And we looked at, oh, and then, so we also took a, a variety of different geographic regions. So not only are they diff from different habitats, but they're also from all, kind of all over the world. And um, we looked at the small scale features on the only interface that touches the, the environment for them. So we looked at the, the ventral scales or the belly scales of these individuals. And so we took AFM measurements looking at, so this is a 10 micron by 10 micron scan. The head is at the top of this slide here and the tail is towards the bottom of the slide. And so what we see in a lot of different animals is this sort of these head to tail oriented spikes pointing along the body. And uh, so you can see that there are you know, several hundred nanometers tall and that they project out of the body um, pointing towards the tail. And so we took these AFM scans for all of the individuals that we investigated. And what you see is that for a lot of these different animals, these head to tail oriented spikes, some variation of these head to tail oriented spikes exists. And this is also consistent with what has been found in, in previous literature, looking at a wide variety of snakes um, across many different habitats. What's noticeably different though is these three individuals at the top here seem to have 
a noticeably different structure. And so in some situations they've completely, they just don't have this isotropic, this, this anisotropic structure. And um, this is a greatly reduced anisotropic structure. And so if we take a look at sort of how, so we could ask a few questions about what might be driving this change or this difference. Um, and so one question could be sort of how closely related are these individuals? Maybe it's just something about um, you know, their, their phylo phylogeny. And so the two, um, two of these are from the African family of vipers. Uh, and so they're, we have, they're thought to be sister species. So they're pretty closely related. Um, however, the third individual is from uh, American vipers, which is very distantly related. Their, their common ancestor is thought to be over 40 million years uh, old. And so these are, you know, we have this convergent evolution of this structure um, in these very distantly related individuals, which suggests to us that maybe there's some benefit to having this, this, more, this more isotropic structure. And so if we zoom in on this American uh, viper subfamily, the other thing that we notice is that if we look at our, our uh, sidewinder specialist um, and compare it to its two most closely related um, relatives within this tree, we see that their structures are noticeably different as well. And so we really think that there's a, been a loss of this anisotropic structure in favor of a more isotropic structure um, and so we're interested in trying to understand what the benefits of that isotropic structure might be. And so to first quantify these structural anisotropy within these individuals, we took um, power spectrum of each of the scans that we have. And so you can see for most of these, there seems to be a strong dominant component along the horizontal direction. And then for, for like say the sidewinders, we see um, a much less, uh, directional dependence of the power spectrum. And so we decided to quantify this structure by starting with the AFM scan and we took the power spectrum and we took the radon transform through this power spectrum to basically get an angular dependence of this power spectrum um, so to quantify this power spectrum as a function of the, of the angle. And we identified the position at which the, the intensity is maximum. And so this is this theta max, which is roughly um, 90 degrees here. And so we took an intensity slice through this particular part of the radon transform. And so this is, we get this uh, very sharply peaked intensity profile. And then we looked at the uh, angular slice that was 90 degrees away from that. And so what we see is that that profile is extremely different from the one where the, the one for the theta max. And so we wanted to quantify how different or similar these two distributions might be. And so um, for that, we, since we wanna measure sort of the distinguishability with the idea being that if there's no angular dependence in the power spectrum, then these slices are gonna look identical. And if there is a strong angular dependence, then these two slices will be very different from each other. And we're interested in this sort of 90 degrees perpendicular because we want to look across the body and along the body um, to see how the forces for movement may be affected by these structures in these different directions. And so um, we calculated the Jensen's Shannon divergence of these angular slices, which is just um, essentially asking how distinguishable these two distributions are. And so if this, this number is bounded between zero and one, if they're identical, um, and they're indistinguishable from one another, then this number will be zero. If they're perfectly distinguishable, then this number will be one. And so we calculated this for all of the individuals that we looked at within our sampling, and we get a wide range of values across many different individuals. And if we look at our three sidewinding specialists, we see that their values are pretty low. So the structural anisotropy is pretty small for these three. And just for comparison, um, I picked three others where the structural anisotropy is higher, and you can definitely see that there are these prominently featured spikes that are pointed from head to tail in these three other individuals. And so one of the things you may notice about uh, these animals with this low anisotropy is that they seem to be uh, inhabit sandy environments more often than not. And so we could ask if this is a function of just living in a sandy habitat, 
And so oops, the first thing that you'll see here is that the sidewinder rattlesnake, which we've seen already, um, it's capable of moving in sandy environments pretty well. And this is the, the AFM scan for this individual. Um, we looked at a very different snake, um, the shovel nose snake, which actually inhabits. So the, this, this sidewinder lives in the Mojave Desert. This shovel nose snake also lives in the Mojave Desert and uses a different form of locomotion to get through sand. And it also has these prominent head to tail oriented microscopic spikes. And so what this tells us is that it's not just a function of the environment. We really think that this loss of structure is somehow related to the behavioral change and you know, specific to sidewinding locomotion. And so we wanted to create a model in order to understand how these structural features might be related to differences in frictional interactions with the environment. And so this is just a very oversimplified cartoon looking at these three different, uh, three different scenarios. The first is this sort of head to tail oriented spikes that we see in most snakes. And so our hypothesis is that these head to tail oriented spikes make it difficult for material to flow uh, sort of across the spikes, that that would be harder to do, or the friction would be higher in this direction than it would be going down the body and along the spikes. And so in our very oversimplified picture, um, that could you could imagine that maybe that's something akin to sort of corduroy ridges where material can easily flow down these lines, but it's harder to flow across. Or if we think about sort of having passive wheels along the body of the animal, that the rolling direction, which is much easier, is aligned with the, the backbone of the body and this sort of axle direction, which would be very hard to drag, um, you know, high, very high friction would be oriented perpendicular to the body. And if we think about this other situation where there isn't any really directional dependent structure, then we could ap approximate that or we hypothesize that that is uh, associated with uh, an isotropic interaction with the substrate. And so there is no preferred direction of movement. Everything is equally easy. And then the third situation, just for completeness, which we have not yet seen in nature, would be their material could more easily flow across the body rather than perpendicular, sorry, rather than along the body. And so that would be this scenario where you would orient these wheels so that the rolling direction is easier across the body rather than along it. And so we take this, these frictional differences, this, I, this idea of the friction up across the body versus along the body. And we're gonna use um, resistive force theory to try and, and model these frictional interactions with the substrate. And so just to give a brief overview of resistive force theory, this is essentially um, originally developed for movement in highly viscous fluids. And so um, in these situations, disturbances are highly localized. So you can treat each segment of the body independently. And essentially, um, you know, the, the net force in the body at any moment in time is approximately zero because inertial forces are negligible. It's just so viscous that, that these terms are small compared to viscous forces. And so uh, you have a, in a locomotor, you have an, a locally or internally driven shape change um, due to this self-deformation of the swimmer and that induces some environmental force. And so if we look at that particular segment, then we have a force that is perpendicular to the orientation of that segment and parallel to the orientation of that segment. And so at every moment in time, the force is just the sum of those two. Um, and that we can solve for the swimming speed of the animal by, by adding those things up along the body. And so in viscous fluids, this was solved by Gray and Hancock in 1955. Um, in granular materials, it's found that this works actually better than in, in viscous fluids. Um, and so this was you know, realized in the early 2010s, late 2000s. Um, and then more recently, we found that this actually works pretty well in modeling cool and friction interactions also. And so just to simplify things a little bit, um, we're, so we're gonna use the resistive force theory framework to investigate the differences and how these two you know, frictional components, how do you basically how the tangential and the normal forces uh, are important in these various types of movement. And we're gonna sort of decouple that from the physics of the environment just because there is uh, an anisotropy 
in, introduced by say um, viscous fluids or sand or other things like that. And so we're just gonna focus on the structural anisotropy and the differences in friction that might introduce. And we're gonna use kinetic Coulomb friction, but we're gonna introduce this, uh, this coefficient C uh, on the normal forces, which allows us to basically tune how important the normal forces are relative to the tangential forces. And so we're gonna measure, we're gonna calculate basically how much, how fast the swimmer can move, how fast the snake can move uh, as we tune this parameter C. And then, so just to, just to remind you that um, given that this is the, the ratio of the normal forces to the tangential forces, the C greater than one would be sort of material can flow more easily along the body than across it. And so this is what we're hypothesizing is uh, what we see in most snakes. The C equals one is more like the sidewinder, which we see this sort of isotropic structure. And then the C less than one is what we don't really see in nature or what we haven't seen so far. And so if we run our, our model for lateral undulation, um, basically in lateral undulation, all segments of the body are on the ground at every moment in time. And so we just run our model for shape deformations along the body and look at how displacement over a, a single cycle is affected by this anisotropy coefficient. And we find that as you increase the anisotropy, so basically as the normal forces become uh, more important than the tangential or higher than the tangential forces, then we see an improvement in, in performance in lateral undulation. And so, like I said before, we're hypothesizing that that's sort of the, the effect of these spikes on, on most of the animals that we see. If we look at sidewinding, however, we see something different. And so it's the only difference between these two models is the portion of the animal that's on the or the portion of the simulation that's on the ground at any moment in time. And so sidewinders are lifting portions of their body as they move. And previous studies have found that about 34% of the body is on the ground at any one time. And so we basically just change the model to vary the amount of body and the portions of the body that are on the, on the ground uh, at every moment in time. And so we see that there's this decreased performance predicted as you increase anisotropy. And so it actually would be beneficial for sidewinders to have a less anisotropic structure. And so just to show you that this is not something special with the particular waveform I've chosen, um, we looked at this dependence as a function of the curvature along the body. And so that's what the horizontal axis is here. Um, and we looked at this displacement and body lengths per cycle as we vary the curvature and for different levels of anisotropy. And as you see that, the, as we increase anisotropy, performance is better across all curvatures. And so if we look at snapshots of what that might look like for the swimmer, so this is showing one cycle of movement, what we see is that basically for an isotropic structure, this swimmer won't actually translate anywhere. It basically just slides around, but doesn't move anywhere for lateral undulation when this anisotropy is one. If we increase that up to 20, then you can see the, the swimmer is actually able to move pretty well. And so um, that's consistent with what um, we've seen before in, in lateral undulation. Um, if we look at, and then also I just put a, you know, I put the Kyanactis, this the shovel nose snake data point on here, just as a point to show that, you know, it's consistent with animal data as well. Uh, we don't exactly know what the anisotropy is, but it's, it's just pretty consistent. It's reasonable. Um, and so then if we look at sidewinding in comparison, again, we're measuring as a function of curvature and we see the opposite trends. We see that as we turn down uh, or as we turn up the anisotropy performance decreases um, pretty substantially. And so uh, I also added some animal data here. We had data for sidewinders moving on hard ground as well as sand. And so it is interesting to see that um, they do perform worse on sand where there is that environmental anisotropy coming in as well. And so we don't quite know how to, how those things interact with each other, but um, this is consistent with our expectations that there would be a decrease in performance on sand. And so if we take a look at the trajectories of these two uh, situations, this is for an anisotropy equals one, you can see that the, the simulation predicts that the progression would be, you know, pretty substantial. 
And if we look at this higher anisotropy, then it definitely does not displace as far. And so we can look at videos of the sidewinders just to see if we can get a sense of what's actually happening, why their performance is decreasing. And so this is what the simulation looks like if the anisotropy is equal to one. And if we turn up the anisotropy to 20, it definitely doesn't displace as far. It seem it just, it, it looks like it's more of a struggle. Um, it's not clear from this though, why there might be an issue. And so we can actually look at the velocity vectors. Um, so if we take a look at the velocity vectors at a particular snapshot throughout this, the movement, um, for the anisotropy equals one, this is what the velocity, the instantaneous velocity looks like along the body. And for this higher anisotropy, um, the velocity vectors are a little bit different. And I'm not sure how well you can see it here, but if we zoom in on this contact region, which is really the only thing that we care about here, um, what we find is that the higher anisotropy essentially causes the force balance to, to find, you know, the only solution is that there's a component of the velocity pointed against the direction of motion. So it's essentially like the animal is fighting itself to move forward and that hinders its progress. Um, and so the having this lower anisotropy actually enables you to slide lateral to the body and doesn't hinder your performance as much. And so we think that this isotropic structure really is helpful in, in allowing animals to move more effectively in these environments. And so another question that we can ask is, you know, that we notice this difference between the Saharan animals, uh, which have basically no anisotropy, and this Af American sidewinder, which has reduced anisotropy compared to non-sidewinding snakes, but it still has some. And so, you know, why might these differences, why, why might we see these differences? Um, well, we think that it has something to do with the ages of the deserts. And so the Saharan desert, it turns out is uh, at least 7 million years old. And um, so that we think that, that that has given these animals a lot of time to evolve this behavior as well as changes in their structure. And um, previous work has also noted that um, probably the common ancestor of these two animals sidewind was a sidewinder as well. Whereas if we look at the American sidewinder, um, this inhabits the Mojave Desert in North America. And it seems that this desert is maybe only 15 to 20,000 years old. So it is a much younger desert. And it's also thought that the most recent um, common ancestor, you know, that the relatives of the uh, American sidewinder did not sidewind. And so we think that it's it's really just an early, this that this one is sort of in an earlier stage of this evolutionary process and that it is moving towards uh, this much more isotropic structure, but it just has not had as long to, to make that transition. And so just to sort of conclude for today, um, so what we've found is that this American sidewinder has a remarkably different uh, microscopic structure on its belly from its closest relatives. And it also moves in a different way. So this it sidewinds, whereas its relatives do not. Um, and this structure resembles it's much more, uh, it's much more closely, the structure much more closely resembles that of its distant relatives um, that inhabit the Saharan desert and that also sidewind. Um, and so a mathematical model that hypothesizes a link between structural anisotropy and frictional anisotropy suggests that this is beneficial for movement. Um, and so this gives us a way to, you know, this, this also basically makes a prediction. There were some other sidewinding specialists that we were not able to get a hold of for the study. And so we have a prediction for what that structure might be. And so moving forward, I think that there's a lot of interesting things to do. This is just getting started, trying to understand how these structures um, are driven by environmental physics and how, um, how they might benefit the, 
animals that have to interact with these soft and flowable materials. And so um, with that, I will conclude and just thank my co-authors on this particular study. And I'll also just shamelessly uh, self-promote for a moment and say that I have just joined the physics department at Emory. I started in January. And so I'm currently recruiting postdocs and, and graduate students that are interested in these sorts of things. So um, if this is exciting to you, then please let me know and um, I'd love to chat with you. So with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Thanks, Jennifer, for an interesting talk. And we have several questions. And so Tomas asked, can the non-sand snakes, oh. <laughs> can the non-sand snakes learn to move in sand, particularly young snakes? And he wonders <laughs> if the forces from and the abrasion from the sand movement can explain the shape difference. So we have not seen any evidence of snakes learning to to do better in these environments. Um, if they were exposed when they were young, I have no idea. That's a good question. Um, my my biology colleagues might have a better answer for you, but I I don't know if if they could learn if exposed at different ages. Um, we don't think that there's abrasion. We don't think that the cause of these structural differences is abrasion uh, because the structural differences are so. Uh, I'm trying to get to the slide. There isn't really any jagged features or rough features. And there are, in some of these, you can see that it looks like there are pieces broken off, um, particularly maybe here. And so we would expect that if it was uh, something like that, that there, there would be some more jagged parts to, to, the, to the structures. And also, you know, given this snake as well, we think that it's not just the sand abrading these structures, that this, this head to tail structure is intact on this animal that, that inhabits and regularly moves in sand. Um, Tom Wyatt asks, he asks about the pores, that the pore-like structures that we seem to see in the AFM images and wonders why, um, why the side winding, or the side winding snakes might have these pores. That is a great question and we don't know the answer right now. Um, and so these studies right now have been limited to shed skins. So this is sort of another place that extending that out and, and looking at either tissue and looking at the skin intact on the animal or looking at tissue underneath it, you know, with, with that, and that stuff there as well, maybe that would become clearer. Right now we have no idea what, what the purpose of these pores is. Okay, thank you. And one more question, and then we'll move to the informal discussion. And so Wiley asks uh, if the snakes vary their contact area during locomotion or if it stays relatively constant and how this contact area might be used to change the uh, velocity uh, direction. That's a great question too. So the sidewinders, do vary the amount of their body that's in contact with the ground, um, particularly when they're climbing sandy slopes. Um, so they're very good at, at climbing dunes and things like that. And so what we think is that they're modulating that contact to sort of distribute the forces in a way to minimize avalanching events. Um, and so they're definitely able to change how much of their bodies in contact with the ground in those situations. Um, we don't really ever see them Get to the point where they're laterally undulating. So it's never full contact with the ground, but they do put bigger portions of their of their body in contact with the ground. And that has, as far as how that affects speed, um, it's hard for me to say. I don't I don't know that I've seen it independent. Certainly they climb hills more slowly than they move uh, on flat ground, or I think that that's true. So, but, but they're also changing how much of their bodies on the ground as they're moving in those situations. So it's hard for me to decouple the two. I just, I just don't know. <laughs>